identifying owl pellet rodent species by a circular template, by a circular template. This is another JDW Talks. My targeted audience for this one are users and teachers of pellet labs, ecologists, field biologists, science fair students, etc. I am giving you a handout. There's a link right there on an article I wrote a number of years ago, plus an augmented key. You can find out more about me at that website there on the google.com site. This was recorded in September of 2020. And I'm going to give a bonus here for teachers. I found this in my files. Uh, a spring workshop in 1993 for the Orange County Science Education Network, California Science Project. And it's a book of science songs and all sorts of miscellaneous things that I think you will enjoy. So let's start off by saying, what is an owl pellet for those of you who don't know? And an owl pellet was on the first slide. It is a compact mass of bones, feathers sometimes, fur, exoskeletons from insects, and other undigestible animal parts that an owl regurgitates, throws up, ejects, after eating a prey item. They are useful because they allow us to examine what is in an owl's diet without having to capture or kill the owl. And I'm going to show you some references at the bottom of these slides. And one of these slides will show you where that reference comes from. So if you never dissected an owl pellet, let's do it. And I found one pellet in my collection that had not been analyzed yet. Um, so uh, let's see what this will look like. This is uh, uh, the ruler that you see actually is from Census 2000 Publicity Ruler. And the full caption was, this is your future, don't leave it blank. So it's kind of cute to have that uh, underneath this watch glass. And what you have is an owl pellet here. Uh, it's not very large, actually. And I was hoping that it would have more than one prey item. My experience has been that the smaller pellets often have multiple items, prey items, while the largest pellets usually have only a single. So what you can do, and some people wear gloves, uh, I just wear, you know, to do it with hands, is you hold the pellet and you start to um, try and, uh, um, you know, uh, open it up. Uh, by hands. Now, usually, even though it looks pretty dense, uh, it usually will give give uh, in a certain plane uh, within the pellet. So there on the left side, uh, I have maneuvered it so that when I tried to open the pellet with both hands, it eventually opened up in that area. And then what you can do, uh, you can have forceps, uh, you can have uh, nails, you could have toothpicks, although uh, that would have to be pretty strong. Uh, then you start to maneuver the pellet and remove the bones. And you can see there are lots of bones here. And there is a skull that suddenly appears. Uh, you can try and remove as much of the hair as possible. And I have another watch glass that the bones will be transferred to. So, and there's uh, a femur that shows up. And you're left at the end with two watch glasses or whatever you want to use. One of them just filled with hair. And actually, one can identify animal uh, groups by hair if one wanted to do that. There are keys to that. And on another watch glass are the bones we got. So, all these bones came from that one pellet that one pellet and we're going to look at the, these bones in more detail in a second so there are three possibilities here about why do owl pellets 
Uh, one would be just to uh, do it from the owl's point of view. Uh, what are owls? What are their adaptations? Uh, my pellets, I think, mostly came from barn owls. They have specially adapted feathers to reduce flight noise, great hearing. In fact, their ears are at different levels of their, uh, of their, of their head. Uh, the front of the barn owl is like a parabolic reflector. They can hear a mouse in complete darkness if the mouse is making noise on leaves, for instance. And barn owls may actually be the origin of ghosts because here you, you are out in a haunted house. You see this object, this whitish object in front of you. It doesn't have any sound because the special feathers of the wing dampen the sound. And people don't know that barn owls don't hoot. They don't hoot. They screech. And their eyes are pretty much forward. And so some people think that that's the origin of, of the ghost idea. So there are lots of things one can do about, about uh, with owls, uh, and the pellets are secondarily. So also in this section, uh, where do you get barn owls or barn owl pellets? So the, there is an interesting article that I have in my files. It's from 1992 in which I guess this is a real name of a person, R.A. Hoots, uh, did a kind of holistic view of a barn owl. And in this particular case, the owl was the important part uh, of, the, uh, of the talk. The, uh, the pellets were secondarily. But there is a, uh, a major mistake here in this paper, and I want to emphasize that. So if you do use this. And this person indicated that one way of sterilizing pellets was to microwave them. Do not do that. Uh, sometimes uh, it's not that common, but it does happen that a owl pellet contains a bird. And that bird may be banded with an aluminum band. That band in a microwave oven is going to create havoc. It's going to arc. And, and it's, it's not going to end, end well. So do not microwave pellets. And I'll talk a little bit more about sterilizing pellets in a second. There are commercial sources for owl pellets. It's a big deal today. Um, uh, lots of school groups use it for one of their science lessons. Uh, and you can see here on Amazon that they're being sold. It's a big commercial operation. But if you do get pellets from a commercial source, you may not know what area of North America they came from. Uh, they may be mixed. Uh, they may not correlate with where the company headquarters is located. Uh, thus, the expected prey species for that area may not be what you find in your pellets. It's not a range extension. Uh, it's that you got a pellet from an area that you didn't expect. And so that will create an error if you attempt to use these pellets for ecological studies. And I'll talk about um, ecological studies in the last part of this talk. On the other hand, you can collect your own owl pellets uh, if there are owls in your area. You need to be sure it is an owl pellet. Uh, is it under an established roost? Uh, are there owl feathers underneath the tree or other structure? Can you see bones on the outside of the pellet? Are you sure it's not scat or fecal material from some animal? Um, you don't want that. And make sure you don't handle the pellets directly. What you do when you collect owl pellets is uh, you can use gloves or you can pick them up with a plastic bag with your hand inside the bag. And this website that I'm showing you there uh, tells you how to sanitize owl pellets. But not all pellets are from owls. Um, most birds will eject a pellet. So here is one pellet from a bird that I have in my collection. Uh, you can guess perhaps what, what it came from. It's the biggest one I've seen from this species. And it is a bird species that ejected this pellet. The animal it came from uh, is an opossum. 
So you don't expect an owl to eat an opossum. And the pellet came from a roost of turkey vultures who are scavengers. This pellet won't have much uh, bone material. In fact, there may be no bone material in this pellet. You don't want something like that for a school uh, ex exhibition, a school laboratory. And here is uh, a, uh, a foot of an opossum that was scavenged by turkey vultures. And you can see what's left is there, most of the bones are there. Um, and uh, the turkey vultures are stripping uh, the meat from the bone. Here is another turkey vulture pellet. Uh, the coarse hairs are, are probably from a deer. And inside of this pellet, you're not going to find this in an owl pellet. Inside of this pellet is a hoof of probably a uh, stillborn uh, fawn uh, on that. So be very careful exactly uh, what the pellet represents. And don't pick up a pellet that's just out in the open somewhere uh, because that may be a, uh, a mammal scat. And they may have ta tapeworms in them. You have to be careful. You have to be careful. So that website down there uh, tells you how to sterilize our pellets. They recommend wrapping each pellet in a layer of aluminum foil. Uh, what I would do is I would actually dry it in the sun first to get rid of a lot of the moisture. Uh, maybe even put some salt around the pellet. And then you can place it in an oven preheated, they recommend, to 325 degrees Fahrenheit. Leave it in there for 40 minutes, maybe as much as an hour. Heat it to that, and they can indicate that it probably will kill most bacteria and other, quote, bad stuff that might be present. The other, quote, bad stuff may be that the owl pellet on the ground may attract flies. Uh, there may be um, uh, other decomposers that are attracted there. And you don't want that to be present in an owl pellet. Now, there are some hints about actually opening up an owl pellet. Uh, these authors in 2011, and we'll show you where to get that paper later, indicate that, that sometimes you can submerge the owl pellet in water. And that will prevent airborne fur, uh, which is unpleasant to breathe. Uh, and also uh, students with fur or feather allergies that will cut down on that. And they may also want to uh, use gloves. And certainly uh, elementary school students think, gee, this is disgusting. This is really interesting. Uh, I got a whole bunch of comments like that when I helped an elementary school teacher with her owl pellet lab. And certainly make sure students clean up and wash their hands thoroughly after the laboratory. So another thing you can do with owl pellets, this is the second aspect, is to treat the pellets as an anatomy lesson about the bones of a rodent. So the students can name all the bones. They can compare human versus rodent bones. They can uh, put the bones in the right order. And I've seen uh, situations where a, stu a student project was to take their bones from an owl pellet and glue it on a piece of paper to try and recreate the sequence of bones uh, from the skull on the top glued in, uh, the uh, spinal column, all the way to the tail. So one question you might ask is, uh, if an owl does eat a, a rodent, how many bones actually are rejected? And there is a very good paper by Dodson and Wexler. It's available on, on JSTOR, JSTOR, J-S-T-O-R, that link in the bottom, is available uh, from some libraries and academic institutions uh, for free. And you can check to see if you can get that article for free uh, on that. Uh, all the information is there. And so what they did was they looked at a variety of owls and they found out that it really differs about how many bones come out. For instance, a screech owl, uh, when it, uh, it uh, gets prey, tends to scrunch the prey back and forth in its bill. So there's a lot of fragments of bones there. 
while something like a barn owl might uh, uh, basically swallow the, pr the prey that it kills uh, in one gulp. This also says that barn owls also returned uh, articulated strings of vertebrae and complete pores, uh, which is really uh, unusual. The um, owl pellet I showed at the first slide, uh, which I actually sprayed with a cryolon spray, a plastic spray, to preserve it, shows on that uh, the uh, pore bones uh, of the rodent. Uh, so lots of bones can come through. The Dotson and Weckler looked at three species of, of owl and uh, what they recovered from it. And you can see that basically uh, in most cases, not the screech owl, uh, but uh, in barn owl, for instance, uh, they retrieved all the skulls and most of the lower jaws. And it's an interesting situation, but even the smallest, the smallest uh, bones uh, were also retrieved. There is online a, uh, uh, a bunch of worksheets that you can get. Uh, a, one, one exercise that's done is for students to match the bones to a picture of something like a, uh, uh, a, uh, a femur or a humerus or a scapula. Uh, and, uh, or, you know, and they would show pictures of that. So this is a resource for you. A lot of the commercial kits also come uh, with um, uh, pages that can be printed that have the same idea. So here is my demonstration owl pellet. The first thing I would do is to match the bones because what I want to find out is how many individual prey species there are. And so all the long bones are on the left. Uh, and they're in pretty good shape, you can see. And then the smaller bones are on the right. Hopefully I got most of them out of that pellet. And we'll take a look at the bones uh, in a second. So here is a look at that, uh, that prey item. Uh, we're looking at the skull and the teeth that are still there. Uh, the upper part of the skull has what's called otic capsules. And sometimes those separate from the rest of the skull and those are loose. They are kind of uh, uh, ball-shaped items. And here is a, a dorsal view uh, of the skull and the two uh, lower jaws or mandibles. The shoulder um, uh, bone situation or shoulder blades showing you a picture of a humerus. Uh, an older owner and a radius. And sometimes in uh, very young rodents, the ends of the bone are, are separated from the shaft of the bone because that's a growing area. We go down to the lower leg area uh, and we see a bunch of bones there. Now, these bones are in the right sequence. Uh, I did not spend time to decide whether they were right or left. So it is possible, uh, if you're familiar with these bones, to actually not only identify a bone, but to decide whether it's a right side or a left side uh, of the individual. And the more advanced the, uh, uh, the course and grade level, the more you might expect from students. You can take that FEMA and put it directly into that little circle that's called an acetabulum or an acetic cup to show them uh, joints and how the joints uh, uh, interact and uh, in their own system as well. There is this hip bone, this anominate bone, and I'm showing you a, uh, an article which indicates you can actually tell in a number of rodents the sex of the prey by that bone. So a ecological study might be to decide whether uh, males are eaten more than females by the owl, they're more exposed, etc. You can do a lot of interesting studies. Then we have the smaller bones like the rib bones and uh, the digits from the pores. The vertebrae and the vertebrae 
Uh, some of the uh, cervical vertebrae are on the top, uh, and there are different groups of vertebrae, and uh, you might be able to uh, separate those out as well, like uh, thoracic, lumbar, uh, caudal, tail vertebrae. There are some vertebrae that are fused together uh, right around the pelvic area, and those that is that bone, which is actually a series of vertebrae fused together, is called the sacrum. So the third way of using owl pellets is to do um, ecological studies. You need to identify a prey species here, can correlate it with habitat. Uh, the species might be from disturbed area like a house mouse or an introduced rat. Um, species diversity of an area, uh, etc. But these studies are going to work best if you know the geographical area the pellets were collected from, and better, you should find a local owl roost and analyze the pellets from that known location. There's an excellent paper uh, emphasizing this. This is, I think, free. I'm showing you the... Um, uh, uh, the URL for it at the bottom of using owl pellet dissection as a hands-on introduction to nutrient and energy webs. This is a 2011 paper. So how do you identify prey species? Well, there are keys to the skulls of North American mammals. This particular one by Brian Glass is still being sold. It's being sold on Amazon. It requires a, a large amount of, uh, uh, of definitions and vocabulary. It's filled with pictures of the skulls of various animals. Uh, but of course, you're getting skulls from everything from an elk, maybe, all the way down to a little uh, harvest mouse. And you certainly won't expect that in an owl pellet. There's also a key. Uh, in uh, the book called Mammals of the Pacific States by Ingalls, uh, and there is a key there to mammal skulls with a, a key, but there's an easier way of doing it. And 40 years ago, and it was 40 years ago, I was doing owl pellet analysis and thought, gee, uh, there might be a better way of doing this. Now, if you look at an owl pellet and some of the teeth, you find out that that front incisor, as we start to take that tooth out. Now, when an owl digests its food, uh, the connections between the teeth and the skull or the lower jaw uh, are dissolved away. So it's easy to remove the incisor. You don't pull it out straight. You, you pull it along the arc of the incisor. You can't do that with a museum specimen. And when the incisor comes out, along with the teeth there, you find the following. You find an upper incisor and a lower. And it's very easy to uh, see. Even if the, the skull is fragmented, uh, the incisors uh, stand out. And you can see that the one on the right looks like it's about half a circle. While the one on the left uh, is maybe, you know, maybe a third of a circle. Well, that gave me some indication that maybe one can measure the arc of the circle. Now, uh, rodent incisors grow in a shallow helix, so it's not quite flat here, but their lateral profile uh, deviates only insignificantly from a uniform circle. So my idea was to start measuring the arc of the incisor. I got a circle template. This one is in inches. Uh, they also make them in metric. But I got stuck because I started using with uh, inches or fractions of inches. And it worked out so well that I published this article in 1980 on the, in the Bulletin of the Southern California Academy of Sciences. It's a key that measures the incisor arc and one other characteristic 
uh, often uh, just of the teeth, but sometimes of the bones themselves. And I've given you this um, in that handout, that link to the handout. My barn owl pellets, and I'm pretty much sure they're all barn owl, are from western Riverside, Orange, and southeastern Los Angeles counties of California in coastal sage scrub and urban disturbed habitats. They are not bought uh, from commercial companies. And this method cannot separate out closely related species, which are the same size. So for my sampling area, uh, I'm showing you either a real, uh, a full species name or something like Perignathus species, which means there are multiple species of that genus, but this system will not be able to key them out. I acknowledge a number of people. I did this with Gregory Shockley, who was an undergraduate uh, uh, at the time. And uh, as part of the uh, paper, we asked six college biology majors with no previous experience to key out these nine rodent skulls to genera, to, that's a group using the mammals key in the Ingalls book, which included only likely local species. And without any experience, they took an average of about 14 minutes an item and were correct about three quarters of the time. Now remember, these are college biology majors. But using our template method, it reduced the student's handling time to below two minutes per item, and their identification accuracy went up to 85% for skulls, the incisors from skulls, and almost 90% on mandibles. And I've added, uh, augmented the key uh, to include uh, the common name of the, of the species of rodent, uh, where they're found, disturbed areas like a pocket gopher or uh, wet areas like a harvest mouse. And I tried to put a circle template in there so it could be used uh, instead of a template in that regard. A year later, uh, William Ackerson uh, also confirmed this method uh, by using a, uh, a graph paper situation. And he's at the Page Museum, which is the La Brea Tar Pits. And so he also found out that one could uh, describe isolated rodent incisors by their profiles. I thought that was, that was kind of neat. That was a year later. And then you should know about this paper in 2006 by Hager and Co Cosentino. Um, it's free. You can see, you can get the paper from that website that I'm showing you. Uh, this is also a circle template key to the owl prey specific to the northwestern and southeastern the United States. And uh, he got his measurements from museum specimens, a digital way of doing it. Um, and, but, and his circle template is in metric units. And so here are two more areas now uh, that have uh, circle template uh, arcs. There's some very nice uh, diagrams. He had a biological illustrator uh, actually do some of the things that uh, I think are important as well to identify species besides and the incisor arc. should get that. So let's identify the prey item that I got from our owl pellet. We use the upper incisor. You see it fits pretty well in that circle. Uh, don't, you know, don't accept the first circle you put it in. Try a number of circles uh, of the template. You don't want to see any uh, space uh, anywhere along that outer uh, edge of the incisor on the template. And so we now turn to the uh, my key that five, six, seven, eight are in uh, 30 seconds of an inch. And this is three eighths or 12, 30 seconds. So we look at 12, 30 seconds. The size of that dark circle 
is the number of, uh, uh, of uh, specimens uh, showing you that, for instance, uh, the first one, um, most of the uh, perignathus were uh, 10, uh, 30 seconds. So looking at this, this is 12. There are only three species the, in my sample size uh, that uh, had arcs of 12. Uh, a wood rat, or an introduced rat, and a harvest mouse. Not a harvest mouse, a meadow mouse, Microtus. And looking at that, uh, the molars are, are quite distinct, different. And it turns out that uh, these, this molars were serrated. So it would be a meadow mouse, a Microtus. Here is the lower uh, incisor. It's 24, 30 seconds of an inch. And I didn't plan it this way. Uh, but look at the look at the key. What does it say the species would be? And it turns out in this particular particular case, the key says there's only one species that has 24 30 second arcs of lower uh, incisors, and that's a microtus. So they both agree. Isn't that neat? And there are the teeth. I pulled the teeth out. Uh, and you can see that there really aren't any roots here. These molars are very interesting. They're, they're pleated. They're accordion-like. I thought I would uh, show you from my collection um, some of the lower jaws and uh, some of the incisors material for various species in my area. So this is a pocket gopher. It's in a disturbed area. The... Um, uh, there is a, a slight groove in the uh, inside of the tooth, uh, the upper tooth, uh, not that noticeable from the outside, peg-like teeth. This is a kangaroo rat, a dipodomus. Uh, the, some of these rodent species, the upper incisor, is grooved. And so I'm showing you it uh, on the right. That's an upper incisor. I'm using the lower jaw just to uh, uh, position that tooth. Kangaroo rats are sage species, can be. Here is a pocket mouse, a perignathus. Again, the upper incisor is grooved, and that's an upper incisor. It's been uh, um, shattered a little bit. Uh, it's a little bit fragmented. And here is a harvest mouth. Both, both this and the previous one are both in uh, uh, undisturbed areas. Again, uh, this is a species that has a grooved upper incisor. And if you're a teacher, you should be establishing a reference collection of skulls and, uh, and mandibles and incisors to help your students identify prey. Here's a wood rat. This is a species of uh, or group that's in coastal sage. You can see the teeth have roots here. Uh, these, the, these species from here on uh, don't have uh, any grooves on the upper incisor. A disturbed habitat, an urban habitat, might have uh, two species of radis. Uh, these are introduced into the United States, North America. Here is our meadow mouse. It's also called a vole, a V-O-L-E, the common name. It's usually found in moist areas, undisturbed. And that's what our sample owl pellet had. Very interesting. Uh, teeth, the molars. Deer mice are another uh, undisturbed species, a small rodent. House mice are associated with urban structures, disturbed areas, uh, has its own uh, special um, uh, teeth structures to be able to identify them. You can see the difference between the lower 
uh, and sizes in the upper one here. And there are other prey items that you may find. It's always kind of uh, interesting. You never know what you're going to find in an owl pellet. The owl, especially barn owls, hear rustling of prey and in, in a dark room can, can actually kill that prey, can locate it by sound, fly, and has such a wide expanse of its claws that it can probably get that prey. So here, this is not a, a rodent. It, the shrew is a different group of mammals. You can see from the lower jaw that those teeth are not for, for grinding seed. Those are for tearing flesh. And so these are shrews and potentially moles that you will find in owl pellets. You may even find a small um, uh, rabbit. Um, the skull is probably not going to be there. The owl is not going to be able to swallow the skull, but the lower jaw might be swallowed. And here are a bunch of, of teeth. Uh, there's actually a groove to tooth there, but that grooved tooth is not from the lower jaw. It's from uh, the incisor of the skull. You can see a very broad tooth there, that vertical one. Uh, that's the uh, lower incisor. But if we look at a rabbit skull from the, the bottom, uh, we see that um, it has a double set of incisors. The first incisors, uh, the upper incisors, are grooved, and the low, uh, the uh, uh, the second set of incisors are peg-like. You may also find arthropods there, like Jerusalem crickets. Uh, there may be birds there. There'll be feathers. There may even be reptiles. Uh, so one of the neat things about owl pellets is you never know what you're going to find. So I hope that this little uh, uh, presentation about identifying owl pellet rodent species by a circular template will help you uh, in your labs or your ecological studies. So this is another one of my JDW talks on YouTube. I have two virtual birding field trips, two Life of the Naturalist Adolphus L. Hearman, four birding optics talks, and this owl pellet video. I mean, that's my background is in biology. However, I'm also a, an expert in various aspects of genealogy, and I have eight U.S. and New York City census talks on this, uh, on my channel on YouTube. I also have five Ellis Island talks as well. So if you enjoyed this, um, uh, you can subscribe to this channel uh, and uh, enjoy. Thanks for watching.